Good morning, everyone. Morning. I am Beth Tiggis, the STTI president-elect, and I welcome you to the eighth presentation of the International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame. Before we honor our 2017 nurse researchers, I invite prior International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honorees who are with us today to stand and be recognized. It's wonderful to have so many of you back with us. The International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honors Sigma Theta Tau International members who have achieved significant and sustained national and or international recognition for their work and whose research has impacted the profession and the people it serves. Today, we are honoring 23 distinguished nurse researchers. <laughs> the honorees were selected by an appointed review panel with exemplary research expertise. Each nomination includes documentation that provided evidence of contributions and impact on nursing research as outlined in the reward criteria. The presentation of the International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame is sponsored by Wiley. On behalf of the Sigma Theta Tau International Board of Directors, I heartily thank Wiley for its continued support. Wiley works with STTI staff and editors to publish the STTI's peer-reviewed Journal of Nursing Scholarship and World Views on Evidence-Based Nursing, both of which are free to STTI members as a member benefit. At this time, I once again welcome to the podium Wiley Publishing Manager, Cassie Stovall. I'm thrilled to be here again. This is my um, third or fourth year being here on behalf of Wiley. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful, award for us to be sponsoring and we're thrilled to continue to do it. I will just say a few words because what we really want to do is hear from all these fantastic people. Brilliance, persistence, strength, above all perhaps compassion and passion for what they do. The inductees on this stage embody these words in everything that they do. And Wiley is enormously proud and honored to sponsor the 2000 Sigma, 2017 Sigma Hall of Fame Awards. They truly are leaders. And in the words of this year's Congress theme, if I might borrow it, every day really do influence global health through the advancement of nursing scholarship. Influencing global health sounds like such a small thing, doesn't it? But you know, I've been thinking about that theme as I've spent the last few days in Dublin, and to me, it, it feels like it's about improving treatment and the lives and dignity of many, many people around the world. No small thing, and we thank you for all that you've done to improve that effort. Like Sigma, Wiley's been in business for over 200 years, supporting science and research. Um, as you've already heard, we're thrilled to work with Sigma, Sigma and the wonderful editors on the two journals. I thought I would just say that our partnership with Sigma and journals like the, the two that you've heard of, that, that um, we work with month to month, week to week, making sure that we get every piece of research that needs to be out there, out there to the people. The curation and dissemination of that kind of research, the research that you do, is really the conduit for new ideas, and that is, to me, what impacts science and ultimately improves practice. So, um, I just, again, I feel like it's such a great connection between Wiley and this particular award, and I, I love to hear every year about the, spe the specific things that you guys have been working on throughout long and really fantastic careers. I'd also just, forgive me, but like to take the opportunity to publicly thank Sigma's esteemed leader, Pat Thompson, for her many, many years of service to support the wonderful work that you do in her, yeah. Um, just wonderful work, and we wish her well at Wiley in her upcoming in retirement. Um, 
I'll get off the stage, I think. On behalf of Wiley, I'd really love to congratulate all of these incredible people and the important work they do in advancing world health. Well done, congratulations, thank you. Thank you, Cassie, and once again, our thanks to Wiley for sponsoring this presentation. Now I invite Sigma Theta Tau International President, Dr. Kathy Katrenbone, to the stage for the presentation of the 2017 International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honorees. I will introduce our 23 honorees in alphabetical order to join Dr. Katrenbone on stage. Time does not allow me to chronicle all of the achievements of our honorees. You may also read their profiles in the Congress program book. After all the honorees have been introduced, President Catrambone will pose questions to them. And now it is my distinct privilege to introduce to you the 2017 International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honorees. Dr. Jane Armour has a strong record of mentoring doctoral students, junior faculty, and clinical colleagues. She has conducted extensive work in lymphedema pre prevalence, signs and symptoms, anthropometric measurement, and self-management among breast cancer survivors, and currently leads lymphedema research in three National Cancer Institute funded Alliance Cooperative Oncology Group trials in the United States. <laughs> Dr. Catherine Bowles program of research in transitional care, decision support, home care, and the electronic health record has been continuously funded by foundation and federal sources in the United States. She co-founded Right Care Solutions in 2012, a software company based on her research on discharge referral decision making. In 2015, Navi Health acquired Right Care Solutions. Dr. Diane Carroll has tested nursing interventions and translated knowledge into practice by creating an environment where nurses can ask questions generated from the bedside and are answered in mentored research experiences. Her research has contributed to knowledge that describes the recovery trajectories in patients with cardiovascular disease. Dr. Tricia Dunning's research areas are older people with diabetes and end-of-life care. She has served on the many professional committees, on many professional committees, including the board of the International Diabetes Founda Federation, member of the board of Diabetes Victoria, and the Australian Diabetes Educators Association. Dr. Veronica Feig has been a nurse educator for over 35 years and was the editor of Pediatric Nursing, a clinical and research journal in the USA for 25 years. Her own research focuses on pediatric and palliative care for children and families, as well as health informatics and methods. Dr. May Rosemary Fu has focused on symptom science to develop effective assessment and management of cancer-related symptoms, incorporating it in research, education, and practice. Her research utilizes qualitative and quantitative methods, genomic and biomarker approaches, and cutting-edge measurement technology. Dr. Donna Sullivan Haven's mantra, designing systems to promote desired outcomes, has caused some to say that she has furthered the global tipping point for reforming the organization of nursing in hospitals. 
Her signature contribution to nursing is the Decisional Involvement Scale, designed as an organizational development and evaluation tool for healthcare organizations globally. <laughs> Dr. Cheryl Dennison Himbelfarb has been prolific in her efforts to disseminate research to scientific and clinical audiences, informing research and policy efforts in the United States while driving improvements in clinical practice and patient outcomes. Her work has contributed to a greater understanding of social and cultural determinants of cardiovascular risk, particularly among vulnerable populations. <laughs> Dr. Christine Kennedy has conducted research studies with an emphasis on the influence of illness, media, and culture on young children's developing health behaviors in the USA and Pacific Rim countries. Her policy activity, activities helped to establish universal health care for one in three children in the US state of California. <laughs> Dr. Susan McMillan's research has included symptom assessment and management in persons with cancer and quality of life of hospice patients with cancer and the family caregivers. She has developed several assessment tools, including the Hospice Quality of Life Index, the Caregiver Quality of Life Index, and the Constipation Assessment Scale. These assessment tools are widely used in the USA and other countries. Dr. Sandy Middleton has a track record of evidence translation into practice internationally. She has led large multi-site cluster randomized controlled implementation trials in Australia, demonstrating that nurse-initiated protocols to manage fever, hyperglycemia, and swallowing can reduce death and dependency following acute stroke. She has successfully transitioned this intervention into all 36 New South Wales stroke units. <laughs> Dr. Lorraine Mayan's area of specialty are acute care geriatrics and implementation science. She has served as a mentor to staff nurses, advanced practice nurses, doctoral students, and physicians. Her work on decreasing physical restraints in U.S. hospital settings has impacted policy through the Joint Commission Accreditation Standards and Nurses Improving Care for Health System Elders, Best Practices for Geriatric Nursing. <laughs> Dr. Susan Rawl, has conducted patient-centered research testing interventions, re patient-centered research testing interventions to increase cancer screening among people at increased risk, including those with limited resources, low literacy levels, and minority populations. She is currently conducting a trial in the U.S. state of Indiana to increase colorectal cancer screening among low-income and minority patients and an intervention trial to increase colon, breast, and cervical cancer screening among rural, rural woman, women. <laughs> Dr. Nancy Schmieder Redeker focuses on the health-related consequences of sleep disturbance among people with or at risk for chronic conditions in a variety of clinical and community settings. Working with others, she designed a study to develop a community-engaged sleep promotion program for low-income young families in the United States. <laughs> Dr. Sheila Hedden Reidner works with nurses, medical, psychological, physical therapy, and alternative therapy researchers 
to influence the profession, constituents, community, and public policy in the United States. She is well known as an international expert in lymphedema and for her worldwide service to the lymphedema community. <laughs> Dr. Lei Yeling Lotus Shi focuses on family caregiving for persons with dementia and care models for, and care models for older persons recover, recovering from stroke and hip fracture surgery. Many of her multi-year research projects have been funded by Taiwan's National Health Research Institute and Ministry of Science and Technology of Taiwan. <laughs> Dr. Mary Lou Soul studies the application of simulation and technology and physiological monitoring in the clinical setting and classroom and process improvement in outcomes of critical illness, including infection prevention. Her current research focuses on airway management of mechanically ventilated patients to prevent complications, such as ventilator-associated pneumonia. <laughs> Dr. Alexa Steifbergen's areas of research include the health promotion and wellness of those with multiple sclerosis, post-polio syndrome, fibromyalgia, and more broadly, individuals with chronic and disabling conditions. She is presently a co-director of the Center for Transdisciplinary Collaborative Research in Self-Management Science in the U.S. state of Texas. Dr. Sally Thorne has maintained a long-standing program of substantive research into the complex dynamics of health professional interactions toward optimizing the care of persons with chronic illness and cancer. Concurrently, she has sustained a platform of scholarly activity in relation to the theoretical and philosophical underpinnings of nursing science in Canada. Dr. Katri Vevalenen Jokenen has supervised a large number of PhD dissertations in the University of Eastern Finland and is leading its doctoral program in health sciences. She is recognized as an expert in leading multidisciplinary teams in maternal and child health, health services, and evidence based practice research. Dr. Lorraine Walker is a leading expert in nursing on women's weight gain during pregnancy and the postpartum period, emphasizing the needs of low income and minority women. She teaches courses on global health, quantitative data analysis, and philosophic and theoretical foundations of nursing science, consulting with nurse sciences, scientists in diverse areas of the world, such as Mexico, South Korea, and Iran. <laughs> Dr. Roger Watson works in the care of older adults with a special interest in the feeding and nutritional problems of older people with dementia. Frequently traveling out of the United Kingdom, he has honorary and visiting positions in China, Hong Kong, and Australia. His teaching is primarily focused on life sciences in nursing, research methods, and writing for publication. <laughs> Dr. Terry Weaver is recognized globally for her research on the effect of daytime sleepiness on daily behaviors and the assessment of treatment outcomes. Her functional outcomes of sleep questionnaire has become the U.S. standard for the evaluation of the impact of treatments for sleep disorders to improve quality of life. It has been translated into 51 languages and used internationally in clinical trials. <laughs> Dr. 
STTI has long focused on knowledge development, dissemination, and utilization. These nurse researchers' careers demonstrate how exceptional nurse scientists can succeed in all three of those areas. Please join me in congratulating the 2017 International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame inductees. And it looks dark out there, but I hope you all can see that they're all standing. <laughs> it is our tradition that the STTI president conducts a conversation with the honorees, and I know most of us enjoy this the most. It is now my pleasure to turn this portion of the program over to STTI president, Dr. Kathy Catrambone. Okay. Thank you, Beth. And it's wonderful to see so many people here with us today. And we are really excited to hear the thoughts from this distinguished group of nurse researchers. So we've prepared some questions. And we'll give everybody an opportunity um, to answer two of the questions. And uh, hope you enjoy learning from their distinguished journey in research. So I'll start off with our first question. What strategies have you used to bridge the gap between your research and clinical practice? And I invite Dr. Carroll to start. Thank you very much, Kathy. I would suggest one of the most successful strategies that I have used over the years is to listen to the clinicians. Their ability to identify patterns of um, human responses to illness and to have an idea of what to study as it relates to interventions to improve those responses has been a key piece that I've used um, in my practice and in my research to identify um, areas where we need to do work. So it's through their insight at the bedside that I've gained um, most of my research ideas as well as my own personal experience as a clinical nurse specialist at the bedside to decide what I would study and what interventions to try. Thank you. Um, I think we'll hold our applause until the end because we have a lot of questions, but thank you. All right, Dr. Dunning. I would totally support my colleagues' views, but I always have an open door where clinicians and not just nurses can come in and out. And I also welcome patients to wander in and I get my ideas from there. And on the Patient Safety and Quality Committee, there are often really important issues that we need to address. And I engage the clinicians in the research ideas that they generate as a, a learning tool for them, but also as support for me as advisors. What works clinically is sometimes quite different from what academics think might work in the clinical arena. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Sullivan Havens. So I study the organization of nursing in hospitals and how that impacts outcomes. So the clinical practice setting is my laboratory, and the people in the clinical practice setting are my partners. So uh, I found it very helpful to truly partner, not just give lip service to it, but to draw those people in to inform my research. Um, the other thing that is helpful is to be very, very careful about where and how you disseminate your work so that I pay attention to making sure that I'm publishing in the venues that practitioners will be reading, that they can use my work to inform their research. And another helpful way to bridge the gap is to ensure that you're on key committees, organizations, roles that will influence practice to partner with practice. And for me, that's been the American Organization of Nurse Executives, the American Academy of Nursing Expert Panels on Practice, and of course, the Magnet Commission. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Middleton. Thank you. I would absolutely agree with my colleagues about involving clinicians as part of the research team. 
I also have a strategy where I believe if you can be actively involved in the professional activities that are going on around your discipline specific area, such as professional societies, uh, conference committees, clinical guideline update developments, national peak bodies, you have a conversation with your clinical and your research colleagues every time you meet. It keeps you current and it keeps you involved in what's really important in the, in the clinical area. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Maya. Very similar to my colleagues, my uh, practice setting is the hospital that is my laboratory. And so that really has informed my research over the years uh, in terms of the practice. And then for the, pra for the research to inform practice, I really echo everybody else and look where are you disseminating. There are times when you want to go to a journal that uh, may not be good for tenure, but it certainly will reach a very wide audience if you want to change a particular practice. And besides being involved with committees with your professional organizations that write the evidence-based practice guidelines, if you get invited to consult with Joint Commission um, in the United States, an accrediting agency that impacts hospital practice, um, or with the, the federal body, um, you take advantage of that and you have your voice heard uh, in terms of providing those politicians and accreditors with the information about the practice. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And uh, last response on this question is Dr. Soul. Well, for me, I've been in an academic environment without an academic health center for the past 25 years, and the idea that I've been successful with my critical care research has been true partnerships with the hospital system where I've had an appointment, and having those joint appointments where you can contribute to the facility and their facility contributes to your research has been outstanding. And then, like my colleagues, it's asking those at the bedside, is what I'm thinking as a researcher, does it make sense, will it be practically applied at the bedside? Great, thank you. Now thinking, we'll shift gears a little bit, and now thinking back to your early experience as a researcher, because in our audience we have researchers that are at various stages of their careers. What do you consider to be the most important characteristics of a researcher? And I'll ask Dr. Fu to start. Um, I'm thinking back, you know, why I did my research in the symptom management. Um, it's basically, I think, uh, very cliche words about like a compassion, or but very interesting episode in my life is like I had a patient who had a lymphedema come to the clinic, and she was so the oncologist was talking about how are you doing, honey, and she said I'm fine, and can you help me with my arm? And the oncologist would say, honey, you survived, all right, and then so she after the oncologist went away and she said, you know, I don't need to have empathy, I need somebody to help me. So from that compassion, I really think uh, instilled my passion for really managing patient symptoms. And so compassion is one and passionate about it. Mm -hmm. Really like uh, dig into what means to the patients. Uh, not just what means to you to get tenured, but it's really what means to the patient in their life. And lastly is persistence. And persistence doesn't mean just do it. Really persistence means try to make sure you have a rationale why you do it. And also you are not be waived by people say, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. It's really like persistent to do and also be curious about what beyond the horizon, what is the technology, what is the science which can help you to promote and not to make yourself visible. The reason is like you can be visible, come to the conferences to present your work and you can be visible really through your publications and be visible building patient organizations. We never thought about that. But I think that's a very good visible. And recently I learned from National Science Foundation how to commercialize your research product. And the most important dissemination of research basically 
to have people to buy your product. So people will never use, which is free. That's what I learned. And so I think as a researchers, and uh, the most important thing for us to learn, it's really how to be a businessman and how to commercialize your product so that you have a more disseminations. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Kennedy. Thanks, Kathy. Um, perhaps slightly different perspective. I think um, I'm further along age and career-wise than <laughs> Mayfu is. Um, my perspective is um, one of uh, from the personal aspect that an individual to be successful in research, they need um, to have an inherent curiosity and. That alone won't, however, underpin a successful career, but um, focus and self-motivation are key um, personal uh, contributors to one's career. I think from a perspective of talking to junior faculty, however, or novice researchers, um, the idea, my younger self, I suppose, would have said you need to be organized and methodical um, as you approach your science and as you move your questions and along in the communities of where you do your work. My older self has a very short uh, response set to younger faculty in which I, I tend to share with them, don't take everything so personally. You, you, it's a, research is not for the um, uh, weak of heart. There's a lot of rejection along the way, as I'm sure everyone on this panel has experienced between publications and research grants, et cetera. But after spending so many years in San Francisco, I, I like some of the thoughts and terminology of um, the dot-com industry there that's been so successful, which is the one term that's used quite a lot is to lean into something. So I think that that's an additional characteristic um, not that you're born with it, but that you learn to lean into your questions, and that underpins the advancement of our nursing science. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Redeker. So I'd like to agree with my colleagues, but I also think that another um, attribute is courage. So it's okay. courage not only about the peer review, but courage to, pro to challenge the prevailing view. In some of, some of our research, we've found things that if we hadn't persisted, we never would have realized were so if we've just listened to the critics and we just listened to other people in the medical community. And so it really takes a lot of gumption and a lot of bravery to sort of do that even when other people think you're wrong. Great, great, thank you. Um, Dr. Shi. Um, I would like to share experience with you. Um, around 25 years ago, before I started my PhD program, uh, there was this old lady in her 80s uh, came to the School of Nursing to look for me. And I was an instructor then. And she said, because she read an article that I wrote in a local magazine uh, about family care for person with dementia, and that's exactly what she was going through taking care of her husband. But back in that time, very few people in Taiwan have heard about dementia. So she was very lonely. She said no one understands what's going on in her life, not even her own children. So she read my article and she wanted to uh, come to uh, look for me and share her experiences with me. And actually, uh, I was very touched uh, because I, at that time I, I was conducting a study on family caregiving. So she voluntarily um, participated. Usually the researcher and go out look for their subject uh, participant, and, <laughs> and this time that's the other way around. And I'm very impressed that she uh, took the initiative and want to tell her story, so I can see how my study can have contribution, kind of uh, provide a channel for the public and the healthcare provider to know uh, the condition of these people, and maybe perhaps later more innovative intervention can be developed. So I think uh, for researcher, the passion and to see the meaning of what we are doing that we can really change people's life, I think that's most important. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Thorne. Thank you, Kathy. The characteristic that comes to mind for me for the success of a researcher is really to truly understand the profession. 
both the practice of the profession and also the deep epistemological structure of this discipline of ours. And I think that's what differentiates a successful nurse researcher from a technician of research in any other discipline. Somebody who can uh, identify and follow through on the really complex and messy questions that constitute human health complexities. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think encouraging young people to really love their profession and to allow the profession to guide them in what they ask and how they answer it is the key to success. Thank you. Um, Dr. Um, Dr. Watson. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, some of this has been said already, but I think the two things are humility and perseverance. I think humility helps you to persevere because as a researcher in any field, you're in a very privileged position. There are harder jobs to do than the one we've got. And I think we sometimes get it out of perspective a little bit. And humility helps you to deal with the knockbacks, which you will get on almost a daily basis. Um, but humility will also stop us from kicking the ladder over behind us uh, because we need to be creating steps and not obstacles. If we don't create steps for other people to follow us, then we're doing less than nothing. But you will get knockbacks. You won't get every grant that you go for. Uh, I didn't, and you won't get every paper published, and not just in my journal. Uh, you will get <laughs> knockbacks. The thing is to just dust yourself off and try again. Thank you, Dr. Waxon. And Dr. Weaver. Well, there's little to add from the previous mm -hmm. statements, which were very comprehensive. I do think, uh, I agree, humility, determination, passion. But, uh, and I always look for that fire in the belly uh, when I'm hiring new researchers, because I think that's the drive that you need. But I think you also have to be a thoughtful risk taker, mm -hmm. that you will go where others have not gone, uh, but you, you need to do it thoughtfully um, to be able to provide a background and a foundation for the justification for why you're pursuing this line of inquiry, but that it is important, um, as been said before, to, to look for the novel area, to look at the new piece that, that's been missing that others haven't thought about, new associations. Great, great, thank you. Thank you for all those interesting comments. Um, our next question is, I think we're all familiar uh, with the importance in working with teams. We've learned about uh, team science. And so this question really has to do with what criteria or characteristics do you consider in determining who to include in your research team? Because we don't do this in a vacuum. We work within teams, and that's a very important um, concept in terms of being able to be successful at what you're doing to pursue your research. And so we'll start with Dr. Armour. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I work in the field of lymphedema, which is a really complex uh, human condition and takes um, perspectives from people from various disciplines. We have on our team people from physiology, from um, health psychology, psychology, medicine, both surgical, uh, radiation, and medical oncology, nursing, physical, occupational therapy, and informatics. And it takes all of us thinking together to solve some of the problems that we see need to be solved. And looking at an individual member to invite to our team, I would want them to be a team player. I'd want them to not just echo my ideas and my knowledge, but to bring their unique expertise to the table, uh, the ability to be a problem solver and to compromise, and also to be a person with discipline who is able to meet deadlines and carry responsibilities. Those things would be really important. I think in addition, um, interpersonal skills and a sense of humor is very uh, helpful <laughs> in being a part of a long-term relationship as a research team. Definitely. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Dr. Bowles. Thank you, Kathy. Totally agree with what Dr. Armour has said, and as, as well as uh, I like to invite people to be on my research teams that have expertise that I don't have, mm -hmm. so that I can uh, round out the team and you know get the work done. Um, I do work in informatics and decision science, and so I have decision scientists on the team, informaticians, statisticians, nurses, and physicians. So a very interprofessional team as well. Totally agree with you about the sense of humor, how many times I have said in our team meetings that, you know, let's just open up a flower shop. <laughs> this is way too hard. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I, I've got a team that sticks together and is uh, able to get over the hard times together. Um, 
I think uh, another quality is that you know they're responsive. That people will um, be responsible, answer you when you need things uh, from them, um, and um, you know meet your deadlines, as Jane has said. Um, I think that's all I can think of right now. Okay. Um, now we'll ask uh, Dr. Himmelfarb. Thank you, Kathy. So. We've got a pretty comprehensive couple of lists there. A couple of things that I would add, and I work in a number of interdisciplinary teams, and one of the most valuable characteristics to me is inclusiveness. And so whether I'm leading the team or I'm joining the team, it's really important to me to work with others who are inclusive, inclusive of ideas, inclusive of um, colleagues, trainees, and stakeholders, and who are really interested in learning from the perspective of others and expanding their own knowledge by including um, those who have different skill sets, complementary skill sets and perspectives. Um, another important characteristic, and sometimes this is not so easy to identify up front, but it's a willingness or desire to stretch oneself um, in terms of knowledge and skill set and to really have that desire to expand and learn and grow. Um, it's such a pleasure to work with individuals like that because I grow as I'm working with them um, and, and, and it's such a reward to see others grow in that way. And finally, I think um, flexibility and flexibility in thinking and flexibility in skill set um, are very valuable as well. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Rao. Well, much wisdom has already been shared and I agree with the uh, interdisciplinary and diverse perspectives that you need to bring um, to a team. Uh, and people who value team science and are open to dialogue and open to learning from one another um, the challenge is you don't always know that someone isn't of that ilk until you're working with them on a team. And so uh, you'll make some decisions perhaps next time. Um, if you're writing a grant, I think it's important for team members um, to have collaborated before in some cases, depending on the grant mechanism. Um, but also to have published extensively in their area because, of course, the grant decisions will be made based on people's bio sketches and what they look like on paper, not how nice a person they are on your team. Uh, clinical experts are essential if you're doing clinically based research and I do clinic based research but I also do community based research. So working with members of, of um, community based organizations as members of my team have been important. And then increasingly um, patients who are the target audience of an intervention that you're building and families are key members of any team particularly at the point at which you are developing research questions um, or building an intervention that that target audience is going to use. Um, I think nurses have always had great strength in involving um, patients and families in their research. Uh, now the rest of the world seems to be catching on that that's an important thing to do. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Ridner. Gee, um, I think I'm gonna take a little different perspective because I agree with everything everyone said. Um, when I first start thinking about a research uh, project, I think about the aims and then I think about the skill sets that are necessary to accomplish those aims. And before I actually start putting words to paper, I s go through a mental checklist in my own head about uh, who and where the, those people might be that could contribute to the project and to the research from the very first part, conceptualization, moving through dissemination. So I really look for people who want to be eagerly involved on the front end and on the project and the grant as it goes in, who want to be involved as it's going through uh, review and responses to review if needed, and implementation. And also people who are willing to disseminate to various audiences because I do a lot of work across disciplines. So I want the work to get out, not just to nurses, but to physicians and physical therapists and complementary and alternative therapists, and I want it to get out internationally. 
So um, I try to take a really broad, comprehensive approach to this. But in the end, I also, when I have to pick between two people, I often lean towards the people who have the most to gain for their own careers, being part of the project, because I'm really committed to trying to mentor the next generation of scientists. So I may err sometimes on taking the less prestigious person who has the best career opportunity yet to come, uh, in lieu of working with some of the more established folks in the field. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Seifenberger. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, it's hard to come at the end of all these great <laughs> <is> answers <laughs> and not repeat them. I've had uh, truly the blessing to be part of a, an established research team for over 25 years. And so as I considered this question, I thought about what is it that's made that such a productive and great team. And we have had people who have come in and out of it over time, and most of those have worked well. And I think the, the points that people have brought up already about uh, choosing people with diverse skills and backgrounds that can offer contributions, particularly to the area of study, uh, are absolutely um, uh, germane to this. I think uh, the underlying one, which I think one in person or two already mentioned, was this um, the interpersonal part, the ability to communicate with others. Because if you are seeking people, particularly with diverse disciplinary backgrounds, uh, believe me, nursing does not have the only way to do these things and the way we think about authorship or the way we think about uh, all kinds of things are different in different disciplines and realizing that, being able to negotiate that. I think um, perhaps the one thing uh, people have not mentioned is I think it's very helpful on a team to have people who can essentially zoom in or zoom out uh, from the phenomena that you're looking at. So. <clears throat> I would call those the forest people and the tree people. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily have to be just one of those. They could change roles. But having people that, uh, when you're enmeshed in details and getting lost in the trees or even the leaves on the trees, uh, can help you zoom back up out to what is it we're really doing and what matters. This has been very uh, key to our team, I think. Great. Thank you. And Dr. Vivalan Yulkanen. Okay, thank you, Kathy. The box is nearly empty. <laughs> we have heard so many things. That's but what true. I was thinking, first of all, I, I want to bring in different skills that has been discussed here all day already. And uh, to, to do international and multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary work. So that is extremely rewarding. Uh, currently, as I'm leading an international project, so we have business people, we have uh, statisticians, we have physicians, we have nurse experts as well as clinicians involved. So it means that you really, you really are interested in the same question and you want to contribute. And what has not been mentioned before, because when you, you work in an international project, I think that cultural sensitivity is extremely important to understand how we work in, with people from different cultures. Coming from being a Finn, <laughs> coming from Finland, it's sometimes so straightforward. And when working with different, you learn a little bit to be more flexible in a way. And uh, what I would like to add is also that you need to be extremely trustworthy and trustful, keep timeline, and uh, all those things that have been mentioned before, but uh, that's what I see that it's extremely important. Thank you, Kathy. Great, thank you. Thank you for highlighting so many of the important characteristics of working in teams. And now we'll shift gears, and the next two questions, they're similar, but um, there's two questions, um, especially in terms of our, our more junior um, uh, researchers who are in the audience, is the first question is, what advice would you give to a novice researcher? And then the second question is, what do you recommend as a most important strategy for jump-starting a research career? So the first question we'll, we'll start with is, what advice would you give to a novice researcher? And I'll ask Dr. McMillan to start. Um, well, I, I have many opportunities to do this, of course, because I have pre- and postdoctoral fellows. And one of the first things I tell them is, I may not be the smartest person in the room, but I'm the most persistent. And so that's probably <laughs> the most important piece of advice. But I ask some of my um, 
advisees, former advisees, when I had, uh, I knew you were going to ask questions like this, and I said, what kind of advice have I given you? And boy, did they have a list. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, one is, uh, I learned along the way, somebody taught me that there's a home for every paper. So sometimes when you finish, finish your project and the <laughs> outcome is not everything you wanted it to be and you think, oh, this is such a waste, you can find some journal somewhere that will publish that paper. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> um, I also tell them that it's easier to write long than to write short, but writing short is better. Uh, that you need to learn how to synthesize things because reviewers really appreciate it. Um, and then there's that old Ray Charles song that goes through my mind sometimes, them that's got or them that gets and I ain't got nothing yet. Um, <laughs> them that's got funding or them that gets funding. And so if you've got a little bit, you'll get more. Uh, and so don't uh, avoid getting foundation funding. Our, you know, the name of the game for us in the States is always NIH funding. But you can't, maybe you can't get that the first time. So maybe what you need to go after is foundation funding. And a lot of my early work came out of, as my husband says, my husband's hip pocket. Um, there's a lot of data out there that you can get without spending a whole lot of money. And you may need that to get started. Good. I think I've got more, but I'll stop. <laughs> oh. Well, I was going to ask you to sing the song <laughs> for us. Um, thank you, Dr. Walker. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'll give the advice that was given to me when I was a doctoral student, and it was from my department chair. And he said, "Expect your dissertation, if you're lucky, to carry you five years." But after that, you have to reinvent yourself because what took you to that first stage may not take you to the second. And as a personal story, uh, this happened to me. In the old days, we used to run things on a mainframe and then have to drive over and pick up a huge amount of printout. And I was driving over and this thought just came into my mind. I'd run this big correlational analysis. What if every single correlation is non-significant? And I don't know where that idea came from, but I guess it was forewarning me, because that was exactly what I found. And so the way that I was conceptualizing the problem had to be totally revised. The way I was measuring predictors had to be, I had to think really deep. So that was, uh, so that's a bit of advice. Be, you may be surprised, so, but you can reinvent yourself. You've got all the skills. And I guess the other thought I have is when you pick your research area, it's like picking a life partner. You may spend as much time in, with that as you do with your life partner. So make sure it's a love affair that can withstand the test of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Dr. Bowles. Uh, I think that the novice researchers need to hitch their wagon to a star. So find yourself a very good mentor, someone that you, um, uh, multiple mentors that can advise you and you can look up to and model your career after. Um, I also think that you should get involved as much as you can. Volunteer to be on teams, to help out as much as you can. That was how I discovered my program of research is working alongside a colleague and just helping to analyze some data and a little side question popped up um, and I was at the right place at the right time because I was willing to get involved. I think also um, you need to seek work-life balance, um, have, be sure that you have um, help at home to keep your <laughs> life in balance, to support the hard work that this is. Um, so having a great partner in your life that's gonna help you um, achieve your goals is really important. Um, I think that that advice about loving what you do is really important because uh, it's, it's a long career ahead of you and uh, publish, publish, publish. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Carroll. So I have um, just two thoughts which have already been sort of already out there, but the idea of the mentor, if you're not in an academic medical center, is really finding the person that can help you work on a research trajectory um, over time. And I've had some wonderful mentors that have been able to guide me through the process. The second 
piece I would like to mention and I think is probably the one that I uh, think is the one that makes you keep getting up every day is the passion for finding the answer to the question as it relates to the patient population or the community that you're interested in. So that sort of irrational persistence in continuing a program of research because you really want to know the answer. Great, thank you. And then um, Dr. Feig. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Um, I, I agree uh, with all of those very enlightening kind of pieces of advice, but I'd also like to say um, I mentor uh, many new doctoral students, and we all believe in our lives today we can multitask, and our multitasking has us scattered thinking, and I think the brain doesn't work that way. I think that focus becomes something you need to learn how to do, that even though you're spread to great, wonderful questions, it takes that ability to compartmentalize and focus. And then when you're in, deep in the data, you're not confused by all of the other parts that get in the way. So I think a really good uh, persistence is part of staying with it. But focus it keeps it clean and keeps it getting done. Thank you. Great. And Dr. Fu. Uh, yeah. You know, I was thinking about in 2003 when I first graduated with my PhD degree and then uh, I was assigned teaching like a 100, the first big class at NYU. And um, I think uh, there's one advice I got from one of my mentors and she said, may really separate your professional life from your own life. And I had a two babies that I have my daughters who was a five and four. And I was thinking about, oh my, my goodness, how about if my daughters were sick, are sick, what I'm going to do? But this is exactly what Kathy, Dr. Bauer said. You really need to separate your professional life and personal life, really plan your personal life, really say, in case there's a problems, and who will help you. And I think I was benefited from that advice a lot because um, I did not even have a one day off from my work after 14 years at NYU. And um, also, um, thank for God, my daughters are healthy. Uh, <laughs> my other uh, suggestion is like uh, everybody said I agree with it, you know. And I, my other suggestion is really if you find your passion about one phenomena you really passionate for, really dig into the literature. When I'm talking about my advisees and also my PhD students and my visiting <coughs> scholars, major shortcomings for them is really not knowing what's going on, what has been done, what hasn't been done. So I kind of like, you know, for this two months or three months, you really dig into the literature, know what people has been done so that you can step on the shoulders of giants. You know, you can look far and you can look deep. And so that's one thing uh, I would really suggest to the junior uh, faculty. My second suggestion is like take a positive attitude towards even means to critis criticism. You know, uh, like what you said, uh, rejection is normal. And so basically, it's normal, basically. So um, when I submit a grant and I tell myself, if I submit 100 grants and I can get one, I'm lucky, you know? Mm -hmm. Because there's so many brilliant researchers out there and, um, you know, you are not the best one, right? So uh, basically, I submit grants, I forget about it. I submit grants, I forget about it. So when I got it, it's like a lottery. So, <laughs> it's a lottery, you know. Um, and also, um, when I get rejections from the pub, uh, like manuscripts, I really go through very detail and don't think it's against myself. And I would say, so with each rejection, basically, you improve your writing and you improve your thoughts. So, um, we have a CTSI at our institute and I never get funded from CTSI, okay, never. So, but I always submit to them the raising is like, a, whatever they reject me, I always get funded from an NIH. 
<laughs> so I kind of purposely just submit to that group of person. Just say if they reject me, I'm good luck, you know. <laughs> so and also really find somebody who is critical and who you know you think is mean, but they are not mean because they are just critical. They want you to be successful. And I specifically try to find those senior faculties who are honest with me, who can really take their time thoughtfully and looking to what I do. And this is what Dr. Bob says: good mentors, not the ones really um, sometimes bubbly with you, but really need to give you a very Thoughtful critics and even like strangers, you know, take it as a positive, and then try to strengthen yourself. So that's the two things uh, I would uh, suggest, you know, to you as a Great. junior faculty. Great, thank you. Some very helpful, very practical uh, suggestions in terms of um, advice for our novice researchers. So taking that to the next step, and the next question is. What would you recommend as the most important strategy for jumpstarting a research career? Because that very often can be a very daunting task to someone that's just beginning their career. And so I will ask um, Dr. Middleton if you would start. Thank you. I think the first strategy that you could, you could adopt and that would be beneficial would be to do your research. So look in the literature look to see who is publishing in the area that you're interested in, but not just publishing anywhere, but publishing high quality studies in high impact journals. And these are the people that you want to hitch your wagon to, as was mentioned earlier. And I think you need to be bold, make an appointment to see them. And I think you'll be very surprised about how generous these people are about sharing some wisdom, sharing some opportunities, and be prepared. Sometimes something might come out of it, sometimes nothing might come out of it, but there might be something small that could arise that you could be involved in in a voluntary capacity, which has been mentioned previously by my colleague, and you just never know what is going to come out of this. And then often when you're, you're asked at this end of your career, what happened in your career, how did you get where you are, and you think, oh, some of it was just good luck. But when you drill down, what you're really saying is that you sought out opportunities, and these opportunities came out of nowhere, they were unexpected, and you grabbed them with both hands. So I would say, seek out the key people who are publishing high quality work in journals that are impactful, and the kind of research that you would like to do. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mayan. Actually, this is um, a rather amusing question for me because I never intended to uh, be either in academia <laughs> or a researcher or even getting a PhD. So I took the meandering road um, for my career. I'm not so sure I'm the jump starter uh, for you. <laughs> so I'm just going to take a slightly different focus, and I agree with everything people are saying, really. Take advantage, you don't even realize sometimes that a chance meeting might be that meeting that opens the door that you just walk through and that sets you off on your journey. So never ever, um, I, I don't want to say turn up your nose, but don't think of someone as, well, they're not in my area, so they're not important, and I really need to be focusing only on these set people. People. Really look at it as who are these individuals and like Dr. Middleton said, sometimes you're very lucky um, in terms of where you go. Um, if on the other hand you are a person that you know you want academics, you want the tenure track, I'm going to caution you to not try for an R01 in your first year that you are at the university. And instead, to really work with a mentor, the mentor doesn't have to be in your area, but a senior faculty person to help you put down a plan of what papers are you going to get out, what small pilot studies are you going to start building on. As was suggested before, you go for foundations, you go for small awards, you keep building 
building up your research because with each step, you will then be able to go to the further step of finally then getting the large um, uh, awards. Uh, in any more now in this day and age that's part of the criteria, they will look at your capability of doing research. So get the pilot studies done and get them published. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Redeker. Well, thanks. I'd like to build on the other comments, but I think the most important thing is to be in a place where you have the supports that you need to do your work. You need to be in an institution where there's a mission that supports your scholarship and that there are financial and personnel resources to do that. Some of that's difficult for some of us. Many of us are women, and it's often hard to, to find those kinds of places. I think we have many more of them today, and sometimes when you're not able to do that, you can build that kind of support with outside people. As someone mentioned earlier, there's a lot of us that are willing to mentor. I've mentored people from other institutions, and I'm sure many of the folks on the panel have done that. But you need to be able to do that, and you need to stretch. Do You need to stretch and find the people that are senior to you, as someone mentioned, people that have published in key places, people that are successful with funding, because it's really hard to do that alone. The other thing that I think it's really important, I'm sort of interested that, I mean, I'm, I'm actually originally a, critical, a cardiac critical care nurse, and I'm now doing pediatric research in the community, so I'm less well known for that than my cardiac work, which is interesting that that was what was mentioned today. Um, but when you go to a new place, look around you and be open to other opportunities. My colleagues from Yale are here today, Dr. Lois Sadler and Dr. Monica Ordway. Both of them are pediatric nurses, and Lois has been doing interesting work with community-based research. And so our new, pro new NIH-funded project is looking at sleep in the community. So it's my interest in sleep and Lois's interest in community-engaged research. And it's about pediatrics. So it also goes to the point of picking your team. Mm -hmm. I know very little, about, I'm learning about pediatrics, but I know very, I knew a lot about sleep. So you need to pull together what you have in your organization and, and be creative in how you do that. Great, thank you. Um, now we'll turn to Dr. Shi. Thank you. Um, I agree with all that have been said. It's all wonderful suggestions. And um, now I'm talking from my personal experience. I think for the young researcher, because I believe, not by I believe, I know that uh, we only live once and we have limited energy. So I uh, encourage the young researchers uh, to be really focused and uh, because a lot of things you have to build over time. It's little by little and takes many years and especially uh, during the career, in your early career, uh, maybe there are a lot of job offers, a lot of opportunities, a lot of positions. Some may be very influential or attractive or very prestigious, but uh, when, when we make those choices, you really have to uh, weight it um, with um, all the other things, especially the thing that you really want. You have to uh, be clear what your goals are and sometimes you just have to turn down some really wonderful opportunity because that might just distract you from your research career. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, you just have to know that you, there are some trade-offs and you have to be very smart when you and think clearly uh, of your choices. Great, great. thank you. Um, Dr. Steifenberger. Thank you. I think these have all been excellent suggestions, and mine, in a word, would be to write. Uh, whether you're writing articles for publication or whether you're writing uh, your first small grants, whoever you send those to, well, first of all, writing's a skill, and you will get better at it as you do it and you just keep improving what you're doing. But when you send uh, articles in for review or when you send them for grant uh, review. I always tell uh, younger researchers that you're getting free consultation and you're getting it from people in high places. So as they give you critique, um, and it's already been mentioned, uh, you know, if you have to take it personal, we'll do that for about 24 hours, put it in the <laughs> box or the drawer and, and then 
uh, get it back out and take your personality out of it and realize what they're saying. And someone mentioned earlier selling your ideas. So sometimes it's not your idea that's problematic. It's how you're presenting it. It's your clarity. Um, making you know, The people in sales would say, if the person said, you no, said no to you, you didn't ask the right question. And so here uh, is your opportunity to say this more clearly. Um, so it will help you um, articulate yourself uh, more clearly the more practice you have with that. And I think is the single most uh, important thing a new researcher can do. Uh, I would relate a personal experience and that was when I was uh, getting around to going for my very first grant from the National Institutes of Health and I knew that I needed a consultant, you know, someone who would be from the outside and more impressive than I was and all that sort of thing and how to get one. And in those days, I know many of you can't imagine this, it was before the internet and before <laughs> email. And so I literally had to make a cold call to this person who was very well known uh, in nursing, very well known in the field. I'm sure my voice was, trim you know, had tremors in my voice as I asked her. And she listened to my, I'm sure, too long description of what I was doing. And she said, what have you published? And happily, I was able to say, I published this in this particular journal, this in another. And again, because we couldn't easily get manuscripts back then, she said, okay, send me your publications and I will do this for you. Yeah. So uh, writing became a very uh, uh, important thing that did help open a door for the future to me. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Thorne. In addition to all the wonderful ideas, I just want to add a few of my own twists to the same kinds of themes. Um, I'm thinking of jumpstarting a career as, as a, a feature of a doctoral program in particular. And my encouragement would be to really read widely and critically and to um, develop the habit of intellectual curiosity, to sort of carry around the really hard questions in your back pocket so you've always got them there in the opportunity of, of finding some scholar that might have some answer, not missing those opportunities to, to come up with a hard question. Because I truly believe that when you're in the doctoral program, that is the only time in your professional career that you really have the God-given right to ask any provocative, really hard hard question. <laughs> and once you get into a faculty position or a professional position or beyond, it becomes a little rude to pose those kinds of questions. But if you can develop that as an art form during your doctoral program and, and really celebrate it and develop the, the, the thrill of doing that, it will be a skill that will allow you to just jump to capture the moment when you're in an elevator with somebody or on an escalator um, without seeming rude. Um, I also w would just like to say that I actually don't believe that you should identify and, and uh, attach yourself to one mentor. I don't think there's ever one individual who can provide it all for you. And you do run the risk, especially if you have a great mentor, of, of kind of recreating the same pattern. Um, I, I encourage people to figure out who you are and what your unique contribution will be. So absolutely read those rock stars in the literature, but don't try and emulate them try and learn from them and figure out your own um, new part. Similarly, I would really encourage people not to have 10-year goals. And uh, a, a lot of those, the anecdotes that have been, been mentioned um, have to do with people sh career shifting and being open to opportunity, seeing something along the road that they wouldn't have anticipated as being part of a career. And I really think that the idea of five and 10-year goals can be really problematic if you're trying to orchestrate a career. You want to be able to really create that. Uh, the, last, the last suggestion I'd have is really um, making sure that you don't fall into the bad habit of chasing the metrics, trying mm -hmm. to get the most dollars in your grant and the highest impact journal publications. The metrics really ultimately are not what has meaning. It's the integrity of the work that you're doing. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And then the final response, Dr. Weaver. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, in addition to those things that have been mentioned, a couple things come to mind. Of course, there's a great importance of finding a mentor. And as been said, it, it doesn't have to be in your field. It could be outside your field because it's truly the, really the discipline of conducting the research that you want to learn. And I was lucky to have more than one mentor who whipped me into shape. I think, though, that you need to be prepared as a mentee 
we talk a lot about mentors, but you have responsibility as well, and that is you must also come knowing what your question is. So often, uh, I've had uh, faculty and mentees come to me and they said, well, I want to research this. This is what my uh, specific aims are, but I can't get them to articulate what the question is they're trying to answer. And then within that, come up with your four or five bullet points um, and really start to plot out um, how your question really fits into the grand scheme of healthcare. I think that um, having, as Suzanne Feedham talks about, a cartography is really essential. Uh, you need that two-minute elevator speech because that's what it's going to cook the reviewer in the first um, re read of the specific aims is that, that statement that's going to catch their eye. And then to explore res resources beyond the typical four funding, the Department of Defense, foundations, of course, but don't forget industry. I've had some great funding from industry that's enabled me to actually find some critical things that will lead to those larger NIH grants because I've got the pilot funding from them. So don't forget those. Great, great. As I was looking over at the audience, there were a lot of nodding heads. So thank you so much for hitting at some very key points um, regarding jumpstarting the career. Uh, then, now we're going to shift gears a little bit. As an international organization, um, STTI, um, what can we do as an organization to facilitate collaboration among nurse researchers around the world? You know, we're very committed to research, scholarship, and service, and certainly the research and uh, promoting excellence in practice. So again, what, would you, what could we do to facilitate that process? And we'll start off with Dr. Dunning. It's a very challenging question, yeah. but we, we tend to think small sometimes rather than thinking globally, as we heard yesterday how important it is. And when I was on the IDF board, it was think local, but act globally. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? It's many of the things that we've heard about mentoring and being a mentor, reaching out, not just waiting for opportunities, but making those opportunities, hitching on your star, as someone up here said earlier, to the organisations that are already out there acting globally, like the WHO and the International Federation of Ageing, and, and where there are synergies, building on those and asking for introductions if you don't have them. You have to be a bit brassy, I think, and you have to be able to pick yourself up and dust yourself off and start all over again when things don't go right. And it may be that you didn't sell it properly or that it wasn't the right time. So looking at what's out there, what people are doing, we heard the, the strategies yesterday, the, the um, global disease strategies, there are a whole range of other global strategies that are also important, that nurses have a, a really key role in. And we should be out there offering our skills, either as an organisation or as an individual, to help people realise those global goals. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sullivan Havens. So uh, I think Sigma Theta Tau is providing a marvellous opportunity at meetings such as this For the collaboration. Uh, for folks to hear what one another is doing and for folks to come together uh, to discover and have that contact and communication. I think individually, uh, we also need to make sure that we disseminate the work that we're doing in venues that will be read by those in other settings in countries. Uh, the networking. I personally try very hard when I'm traveling, especially globally, to make sure that I visit with those in my field who have similar interests. Uh, I always ask to tour healthcare organizations. Um, it's just fascinating. They want to hear what you have to say, and you can learn so much just from seeing your research settings in another country. Um, I think interest groups. Uh, could actually bubble up from meetings such as this, that folks will go on and continue to work together. And I think the big question is, um, your work is so important and others will be able to think about it in a different context if you share it. Um, for me, what I'm interested in is what works for whom, how, and under what circumstances. And it may be very, very different 
across different settings. And one last thing, um, working with our doctoral students and postdocs, uh, I'm finding uh, just last year one of my doctoral students took my decisional involvement scale and her whole dissertation was to uh, readapt it for use in South Korea. And so now we have that version, and I'm thinking, why didn't I think of this earlier with other doctoral students? So we not only have a scale that can be used in another country that's valid and reliable, we actually are now able to do some comparative research. Great, thank you. Dr. Kennedy. Um, I think I'm gonna back that question up into a slightly different frame. Feel free. Um, because organizations or groups are um, a structure, but I really believe that research is all about the relationships. And so there's many different structural or process ways to um, facilitate work uh, globally or collaboratively. Um, however, the relationships are the key to any of that work truly happening. Um, so I think that um, you have to make the relationship central to the project rather than the other way around. And um, you have to create, um, as a PI in many cases, I believe you have to create the space or the pathway so that all members from the different countries or locations or organizations, et cetera, um, are able to um, be part of those relationships um, to nurture both the project and the people in the research um, team uh, becomes highly more critical as you cross different countries and different structures and resources, um, perspectives on the import of the work that uh, you're doing. So um, you have to encourage everyone to really collaborate, collaborate in that relationship. Um, and then um, you have to celebrate and reward those relationships in order for research to go beyond the one project in the one country. And we talk a lot in nursing about, I think, um, uh, cultural or diversity and inclusion, and um, sometimes defined only geographically or linguistically, but I think it's really important in um, collaborating across country, countries that we think about um, uh, more the issue of cognitive diversity, and that there are a lot of different ways to approach um, carrying out your projects or underpinning them. And um, unless the relationships among um, the funders of, from a particular country or the individuals carrying out the project, the population and the um, people, participants in your research work are, um, part of the uh, process uh, and their different perspectives are at least aired, maybe not always acted upon, but at least um, there is a sense of fairness that everyone gets to contribute. Um, there's many different processes and organizations that can help facilitate that from that perspective. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Raul. So I think about three major groups that can help with this. I agree it was a challenging question to think about. Um, professional organizations like Sigma Theta Tau, as was already mentioned, really provide opportunities for us to get together, get to know one another, share each other's research. And then there are other specialty organizations that have international conferences that we would um, have those same opportunities at. But I think one of the things we could think about in Sigma is um, targeting grants that would foster international collaborations and, and setting monies aside to support those kinds of initiatives um, to get those jumps started. Um, I think of schools of nursing as being another sort of entity that could foster international research collaboration, and many of us already do, um, but those could be expanded. Um, at, at Indiana University, for example, we've had um, visiting scholars who come for one semester from other countries to some of them are PhD students, some of those are faculty, um, and we could be creative in exploring opportunities to reach out and have those international collaborations begin with our schools of nursing. Um, and then the, the government agencies that provide funding, I know it seems 
at NIH, they've gotten a little friendlier about international research than they, were, they have in the past. So I think there will be expanding opportunities there to get support um, to do that kind of research. I realize we're getting close to our time, so we've got about five more minutes, and we have uh, another question to get through, so we'll just, um, now I will ask um, Dr. Ridner. I'll try to be brief. That's um, okay. I think um, SSTI is uh, well positioned to try to help uh, make international uh, collaboration the norm instead of the mm -hmm. exception. And I just have some very pragmatic thoughts about some things that might be done to make that happen that are not perhaps very costly. Uh, the organization sponsors many conferences across the world every year. And always making sure at an administrative planning level that there is some example of international collaborative research present at all conferences to hook people in from their student days all the way up to their senior career days as we are here today. Um, something as simple as an author connect portal when submitting to your journals where those of us who might be interested in having you guys electronically hook us up with people who have submitted articles in the same field where we have been conducting research or have an interest totally voluntarily. But there are a lot of people around the world who might not know about people in this room today and we don't know about them, but who might even have an article rejected, but who could connect mm -hmm. if you provided just some formal systems for, for that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would encourage us all to start thinking internationally very young at the entry level into practice with every nurse and try to find some good exemplar ways to make those collaborations known up front from day one in the nursing profession. I think that would help with the collaboration and with this, oh, I don't want to take a research class theme that we tend to get a lot in some of our, our programs here. Great, thank you. And Dr. Viveline, uh, you look Conan. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Uh, just shortly, so of course, this, uh, this type of uh, excellent, wonderful events like we have here with the STDI uh, gives, uh, gives us the opportunity to meet other researchers and then start, uh, start to create networks. But what I think is extremely important that we understand the strategic issue of planning uh, an international research or make a difference globally. So we need to have also strategic thinking and find out financial possibilities or financial support. There's a lot of funding around. It's extremely competitive, but we need to uh, target towards that. So I think that I just want to add this issue on this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And then our last comment from Dr. Walker. Yes, I, I think I had a different question, but I'll, I'll just... Feel free to... I'll just... I'll just <laughs> I thought the suggestion previously audience. about special interest groups was really possibly a way to bring people together at meetings, even if they could be convened at those meetings I've seen even among here groups of people who are doing similar work mm -hmm. and so that's one idea. Uh, and another thing I thought for the question, I, th um, I, I think I made a mistake in terms of which one I had, but was the idea of um, interdisciplinary and international research teams is for those of us who have the privilege of teaching and interacting with students from other countries to really look at that relationship as a two-way one because so often it's seen as we're giving to yeah. them and what I found is they have just as much to give, give to them and I've really tried to structure where I have students from other countries in a class to make sure that we take some time that students in the U.S. as well as U.S. faculty can have the opportunity to learn from them because it really is a foundation for, for building relationships. Absolutely. I guess the only other final thing I'd like to add is I have so much fun reading journals from other countries because now with the internet we have access to journals if you're a monolingual, like I pretty much am, uh, you can read journals from around the world as well as with the aid of Google Scholar. You, can, you know, a kilo is a kilo, so you can start to read a lot of things in uh, the scholarship of other countries, which is also a bridge. Thank you so much. Those are excellent strategies that certainly we will keep in mind. 
And now our final question, and we thought we would end with a, a lighter question to give you um, a couple of good laughs. Um, no, uh, so this is, a, to, if you could share with us the funniest or most interesting experience you've had as a researcher. And I'll turn to Dr. Armour. Mm -hmm. This is a fun question to answer. I yeah. think we have a lot of um, positive daily moments in our research, but one that comes to mind is when I was fortunate to be funded to travel to South Africa to interview traditional healers uh, to learn about their ways of managing swelling for their patients, their clients, and so I traveled far and wide to visit with individual traditional healers through the network of lymphedema therapists and nurses, oncology nurses, that I had met in South Africa. And then one day, going into a dormitory meeting to see about housing for future students for the lymphedema therapy class, I walked into a group of traditional healers. So I had traveled kilometers, many hours, <laughs> to visit people, and here I walked into a group of them who were there to seek housing in that dormitory. And the interesting thing was the ancient spirits told them to delay a day their travel because they might encounter a storm. So they were there the day I was there by serendipity or whatever that brought us together. And I was able to um, meet them and invite one of them to come speak to our class that was taking place that week. So it was just, that's the beauty, I think, of some of the uh, personal experiences we have in research. We plan so carefully and these wonderful things happen and we have to appreciate those moments and bask in that. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Feig. Yes, thank you, Kathy. I have to tell you that when you told me that that was the question I was oh. going to be asked, um, I dreaded it. I had spoken about my work in palliative care and end of life. Is you know, I can bring down a cocktail party when someone asks me about my work. <laughs> but um, so You can so take whatever I, twist you want on the question. I, 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 I'll, I'll go back to my early career in teaching undergraduates research, and I like to model um, the, and, and have them engaged in doing things. So I had this great, and the researchers will understand this, I had this great idea to teach Solomon for group design. I had a deck of cards and I passed them out to the class and I had enough students who could be in each of the four groups. And at the time, uh, it was in the early 80s, I had invented the word called computer anxiety. It was when you're anxious about working on a computer. And the students had very little experience at all. So half of the class, they'd be pre-tested, post-tested. Half of the class would go off to the lab with me. They'd learn how to enter a few things into a computer. And the other half would stay in the room as my control group. And they were going to probably show more computer anxiety afterwards because they hadn't had it yet. That was the plan. When I came back to the room, the emergency department had just been leaving. Apparently, one of the pregnant students in the class had passed out. And they carried her off, and I got back to the room, and the room looked so anxious, I can't even begin to say, passed out the surveys anyway, demonstrated how things that happen at the same time still get in the way of your findings. So I was able to model that. But it, when you plan as best as you can to have things work out, um, it didn't work as I planned. But as you said, sometimes right. things happen that are pretty good. Right. You never Thank know. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Himmelfarb. Thank you. So um, I've had the amazing pleasure of working with many colleagues at Johns Hopkins Hospital and the School of Nursing and School of Medicine in patient, patient safety research and improving quality of care in the hospital. And so we took the opportunity to adapt a lot of that research and that work into a course, a massive open online course that we were broadly offering. Um, and it was one of the first MOOCs we were offering at Johns Hopkins. And so it was a lot of work getting this course together. And at the end of our first week, we had about 17,000 students who had uh, registered for this course, which was overwhelming to me. Um, how in the world was I going to teach 17,000 students? But the good thing is, uh, the way the course was laid out, it was possible. But Robert Kearns, the educational instructional designer who was helping with the course, called me and said, I've got a call from one of the students. She really needs to talk to you, Cheryl. So I said, well, OK. First thing I thought was, oh, no, if I have 17,000 students <laughs> calling me, <laughs> this is going to be a disaster. And I was thinking, how does she even know my phone number? Because none of that is included in the course. It's all, all communication is to be through the course. And so I called this. Um, 
this this student back and i can tell it's so i start talking with this woman and she is very apologetic she's going to have to drop my course and she doesn't you know doesn't want to offend me but she wants me to understand some of the limitations and so i start talking with her a little bit more and again i would never have known that she had dropped the course but she reached out and wanted to let me know that she is 88 years old and she lives in arizona and this course is offered during the summer and they're anticipating a heat wave and her daughter thought she probably should not be tra tra traveling on the bus to the library which is where she accessed the computer to take this course and how might she access the information because she's very interested in learning about being a safer patient so uh, what I learned from this, what, first of all, that was so amazing, and I had the most wonderful conversation with this woman, but you really can never underestimate <laughs> the interest in and need for the work that you're doing. Um, I, I never would have imagined that someone would travel 40 minutes to go to the library to participate in our course, but <laughs> she did. Um, and, and a second lesson I learned was to think very broadly as you think about who the stakeholders of your work might be and how do you best reach them. Right, right. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. McMillan. <clears throat> well, um, er, fairly early on when I was uh, getting some of my first uh, grant funding, I had a couple of projects going at the same time, which was a great thing. And I had about 12 research staff working for me. And we came to December and it was, I wanted to have a little holiday party for them. And I gave them small token gifts to thank them for the work they were doing all year. Um, and uh, they, one of them came up with a big smile on her face and handed me a gift bag, which I had not expected. So I, I took the bag and thanked them. I opened it and what I pulled out was a crown. They had observed something that I had not even been aware of. And that was that in every study I do, it appears that I include the uh, variable of constipation. <laughs> so they gave me a crown that said queen of constipation. <laughs> uh, and I wear it proudly, actually. <laughs> um, when I was uh, a very young woman, my father gave me a proverb that I suspect he made up himself, which is, she who tooteth not her own horn, the same shall not be tooted. <laughs> <laughs> and I've taken that to heart, and so I'm proud to tell you that I am, in fact, the queen of constipation. Well, <laughs> Very good. Not many people can make that acclamation, so. Okay, Dr. Soul. Well, I'm going to try to match Susan's uh, thing. So she may be the queen of constipation, and I'm the master of mucus, so. <laughs> My claim to fame lately is if you need a mucus specimen, I've got a freezer full of oral and oh. tracheal samples, and um, I can give you the recipe to make the best artificial mucus if you're testing things in your lab. And there are things that will work, and there are things that will cause ants to grow in your mannequins. So. <laughs> oh. All right, and finally, Dr. Watson. Oh, thanks, Kathy. Uh -huh. Yes, I've got something to get off my chest that's more of an issue than, a, than an actual event. Um, mm -hmm. I spend a great deal of time in the, in the Far East, which I have a love affair with. And both ways, uh, both from them and towards them, we get confused about names and the gender of names and also the transpos transposition of surnames and Christian names. And I have an ongoing battle, uh, especially in Taiwan for some reason, to convince people that I'm not Gene Watson, the uh, famous <laughs> nurse theorist. And, uh, I don't know where this comes from, but it must be something to do with the names. And I said, well, one, she's a woman, and whatever. But then what happens is something that my wife would say, you just can't help yourself, can you? I then tell her a small lie. Well, actually, it's quite a big lie, and I'm not proud of it. I say, but I am her nephew. And uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I've even been in the same conference on the same platform with Jean when this has happened. And Jean's in on the joke, by the way. So there's a great, deal of, a great many people in Taiwan think that I'm Jean Watson's nephew. And it's time to come clean, Lotus and other Taiwanese friends, that I'm not. <laughs> Good one. Well, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, thank you so much for sharing um, your wisdom, your humor. We really appreciate that. And if we could give our panel a big round of applause. Thank you. Okay. 
I'll echo Kathy's thanks to all of you. Um, we're here to celebrate your intellects in many ways, but we also appreciate your persistence, your sense of humor, and if I may borrow Trisha Dunning's uh, phrase, your brassiness. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> all right. And again, thank you, Wiley, for sponsoring this wonderful program. I am very pleased to announce that Wiley has agreed to sponsor the 2018 presentation as well. Yay, that's good. Nominations are now being accepted for both the 2018 International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame and the 2018 Emerging Nurse Researcher Award. These awards recognize nurses whose long-term or early research has impacted the nursing profession. Nominations are due the 11th of December, 2017. Congress abstracts are due by the 8th of November, 2017. Please share this information with your colleagues and we hope to see you in Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about the award nominations, abstracts, and events on STTI's website. Be sure to join us for lunch immediately following this session. Lunch will be served in the forum on the ground level. And I have one additional announcement. Attendees from the Europe region, um, your regional coordinator, Dr. Joy Merrill, will hold a European regional meeting today at 1 o'clock p.m. in Liffey Hall 1. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your time. And let's give a, a round, another round of applause as our awardees leave the stage. Yeah.